Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I would like to advise those participating that we will be recording tonight's session. Good evening all. On behalf of Eastern Melbourne PHN and Banksia Palliative Care, I wish to welcome everyone to the Banksia GP Palliative Care Workshop Series, when the community, palliative care and the role of GP meet. My name is Nicole Stark and I'm the Events and Education Coordinator at EMFIN. And I'm also joined by Sonia, who is the Palliative Care Program Facilitator at EMFIN. Before we begin, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Eastern Melbourne PHN and Banksia Palliative Care acknowledges the Wurundjeri people and other people of the Kulin Nations on whose unceded land our work in the community takes place. Enfin respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past and present. In the spirit of reconciliation, Eastern Melbourne PHN acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their cultural, environmental and spiritual connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We recognise and value the knowledge and wisdom of people with lived experience, their supporters and the practitioners who work with them and celebrate their strength and resilience in facing the challenges associated associated with recovery. We acknowledge the important contribution that they make to the development and delivery of health and community services in our catchment. Some quick housekeeping. All attendees will remain on mute throughout the presentation. Please type any questions you have for our speakers in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and these will be answered at the end of the presentation. A little bit about um, Eastern Melbourne PHN. The Australian government established primary health networks to increase the efficiency of medical services, reduce fragmentation of care and improve health outcomes for everyone, especially for the most vulnerable. EMFIN achieves this goal by improving access to existing services, commissioning services to improve health outcomes and by supporting GPs and others to innovate and further improve local health care. We aim to improve the health of our community by ensuring people receive the right care in the right place at the right time. We thank you all for joining us for this valuable information session. Palliative care in the community led by general practitioners provides vital support for individuals with serious illnesses, improving their quality of life through specialized medical care and emotional assistance in familiar familiar setting, excuse me. <clears throat> this event will explore the role of GPs in collaborating with specialist community palliative care teams to address patients' holistic needs and identify relevant health pathways. I'd like to start by acknowledging, sorry, by introducing our fabulous speakers. We've got Dr. Chen Chi Lin. He's a palliative medical specialist consultant in Victoria, working at various hospitals and palliative care services, including Banksia. He also serves as a general practitioner on Saturdays. His mission is to enhance the quality of life for those with inc uh, incurable diseases, and he actively teaches and supervises medical students and trainees to promote academic excellence and compassion in healthcare. Dr. Scott Reeve is a palliative medicine physician and Jerry, <laughs> apologies, geriatrician who works across metropolitan health services, including Banksia Palliative Care. He is involved in university and hospital teaching, as well as the, super, uh, as the supervision of medical students, junior doctors, and medical specialist trainees. He is passionate about supporting people with life limiting illnesses and enabling those who wish to remain at home to do so. Wendy is a registered nurse with over 30 years experience with a significant amount of time being spent as a community palliative care nurse. She is currently the training and development consultant at Banksia responsible for internal and community education. And on that note, I will now pass the metaphorical mic to Dr. Scott Reeves. Thanks very much, Nicole, for those introductions. And um, good evening, everyone. I might try and start by sharing my screen.
that coming through okay? Yeah, right, perfect. So, so you, you're probably aware that tonight's the first, or you may not be aware that tonight's the first night of a five-part series, um, which is being put on by um, the Banksia Palliative Care team alongside um, the PHN. Um, and tonight we're talking about when the role, when community palliative care and the role of the GP meet. Um, so a quick overview of tonight. Um, we're going to start by talking about who Banksia is um, and then go into what is palliative care and how is it delivered. Um, I'm going to apologise because I, I want to recognise that there's probably a spectrum of experience in the um, metaphorical room at, um, tonight and some of you will have a lot of experience so please um, uh, bear with me if, if some of what I say um, is already known to you um, but then hopefully it value adds for some others. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the role of community palliative care uh, and in, oh, quite a lot about what um, supports community palliative care can provide. Um, we'll try and illustrate how this works in practice through the use of a case study and then we'll come back to specifically what interventions, medications and practical supports um, we can provide to enable end of life care at home. Um, we'll touch on bereavement support quickly and then we'll talk also about the second learning objective, which is around the, um, the, the requirements for certification of death in the community um, and verification of death in the community. Um, so you may or may not be aware um, this uh, lady in the, the picture uh, in her quote, so Cicely, Dame Cicely Saunders is one of the founding uh, members of the palliative care uh, movement and um, her quote is, or one of her many quotes is, you matter because you are you and you matter until the end of your life. Uh, we will do all we can uh, to not only help you die peacefully but also to um, live until you die. So who is, who are Banksia? Um, Banksia Palliative Care is the only uh, not-for-profit community palliative care service in the northeastern suburbs of Melbourne, which encompasses the three LGAs of Banyal, Nilumbik and Whittlesey. We are a home visiting palliative care service, which provides care and support to clients and their families. And it's 24 seven, uh, 365 days a year. We work alongside uh, other local healthcare service providers to ensure that all of the needs of the client, their family and community are met. And that includes uh, general practitioners um, and medical specialists, as well as other serv services such as uh, aged care facilities, uh, local councils, Bolton Clark. We also have a number of partnerships with um, some of the residential in-reach services from uh, the, our regional um, hospitals. A little bit about our numbers. So if you look at last year, um, we received a total of just over a thousand um, referrals, a thousand and fifty. Um, and of those, uh, they came from different different avenues. So self-referrals or referrals from, from friends, 110. We had GP referrals or other health specialists, 350. Uh, we get a number of referrals from aged care directly, 180. Uh, and also hospitals as well are a large referrer to us. We admitted the vast majority of those clients um, to our service. Um, and of those who were admitted, um, it's still probably two thirds malignant uh, as diseases as a sort of primary disease or reason for them being admitted to our service and non-malignant um, uh, of about, about 40%, 30, 40%. Um, we also supported uh, uh, 748 people in their deaths um, and that would be including 440 at home and 308 of our clients died whilst an inpatient. So what is palliative care? Um, well there's a number of definitions if you um, look worldwide. The Palliative Care Australia definition is palliative care is person and family-centred care provided for a person with an active, progressive, advanced disease who has little or no prospect of cure and who is expected to die and for whom the primary treatment goal is to optimise the quality of life. Key points that I take out of this definition would be that um, there is usually a life-limiting illness associated with people who are admitted to our service. There's usually expectation that they will die from that illness. 
Um, this is not always the case. Uh, it's probably worth recognizing that actually we do have, um, I guess, with the with 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 continual development of of medical sciences and um, and you know, anti cancer treatments and and other um, reversible um, pathologies. Um, we do actually take on younger patients or patients who have potentially curative avenues, um, especially if they have got complex symptoms or other um, need, symptomatic need for the involvement of uh, palliative care. But in general, our focus is on people's quality of life. Um, so although someone might be having um, active uh, management through their oncological team or their um, their GP um, for whatever conditions they have, the focus of the care that we provide is generally symptomatic. Palliative care does not equal no care and palliative care um, patients can receive um, palliative care alongside other treatments which are intended to prolong life. Um, and that is a common misconception um, particularly um, uh, in, in years gone by about um, palliative care uh, or the, the role of palliative care being to step in once all active treatments have ceased uh, and then things transition all of a sudden to a palliative focus, whereas now there is much more of a um, shared care model um, whilst people are having life-prolonging therapies in a lot of cases. Palliative care aims to enhance quality of life and help patients live as actively as possible. Um, it regards dying as a normal process, provides relief from pain and other symptoms. It intends neither to hasten nor postpone death. Um, and that is probably worth taking a moment to acknowledge that there are also sometimes some perceptions uh, in the broader community uh, about palliative care potentially, um, or the intervention of palliative care um, maybe accelerating people's deterioration um, and there is um, you know, there's actually good evidence to show that it's actually the opposite. Um, there was a, a landmark paper um, by Temel that showed that um, in, involvement of palliative care in patients who have got um, metastatic lung cancer was associated with a prognostic uh, benefit, so they live longer. Uh, it also integrates the psychological and spiritual aspects of care. Um, and it uses a team approach to address the needs of patients and their families um, and offers a support system to help the family cope during the patient's illness and in bereavement. Who benefits? Well, uh, would anyone who has uh, the criteria that I, I suppose I talked about just before, if the life-limiting illness and condition. Common patient um, cohorts or diseases that we manage would be people who are living with cancer, uh, often, or, or motor neuron disease, or any other end stage organ disease, heart, lung, kidney. We um, help uh, support people living with dementia, and then also um, a, a range of other specific illnesses, um, particularly affecting pediatric patients, um, such as inherited metabolic disorders. Um, and we work collaboratively with the Royal Children's Hospital um, in, in those such cases. Just a bit of terminology, palliative care versus specialist palliative care. Palliative care is a general term which is used to describe any care that's provided for someone who's living with a life-limiting illness, and that could be provided by their loved one who's living with them. It could be a nurse, a PCA, uh, um, or it could be a medical person, um, a GP, an oncologist, a geriatrician. Um, this notion of specialist palliative care is, a, is, is generally, it's a, it's care provided by a specialist palliative care service, which usually comprises of a multidisciplinary team with specialized skills, competencies, experience, and, and training for people with more complex needs. Can be provided at home, uh, in a specialist palliative care unit, um, in a hospital, in a residential aged care facility, and really anywhere that a person identifies as being their home. So now we're going to focus a bit more closely on the community. So why focus on the community apart from the fact that we work for a community palliative care service? If you ask people where they want to die, the vast majority of people both in Australia and across the world will say that they would like to die at home. Um, so there's 
if you're interested. Um, uh, there was a systematic review in 2013, over 100,000 people, 200 studies, 70% of people, um, if they can choose their venue of care or venue of dying, it, it is home. Um, and this has also been rep um, uh, repeated in Australia, uh, in a South Australian study, uh, about 2,500 respondents um, was asked, if you were dying of a terminal illness such as cancer or emphysema, where would you like? to die and 70% um, again uh, wished to die at home. But where do Australians die? Um, well, the majority of us actually end up dying in hospitals. So 54% of Australians in 2013 data, and I'm sorry, I don't have more up-to-date data on this, um, died in hospitals, 32% die in aged care and 14% at home. Um, you, you could take a, um, a kind viewing of this data would be that dying in aged care is actually also dying at home. And for that person, you know, maybe we are closer to that 70%. But, um, but either way, we're still well below um, the wishes of, um, of or the, the reported wishes of people who, are, who, who have um, participated in those studies. So we know that... Every, uh, the majority of people want to die at home. And unfortunately, um, it's actually only a minority of people that are able uh, and to die at home at the moment. So thank you for coming tonight and hopefully we can help to support those who do want to die at home um, or have or live in the life that they've got left as well as they can at home for as long as possible. So, what are the supports that community palliative care uh, or Banksia can provide? Um, so there is a little disclaimer here um, and I'm mindful that this is being recorded and that some, I suspect that the majority of people who are watching this don't reside within our three uh, LGAs. So um, community palliative care services across Victoria in general will provide similar levels of service but there are some slight discrepancies. So there are um, other services include Melbourne City Mission, um, Mercy, um, uh, Eastern Palliative Care. Almost all of those will provide the vast majority of the core services that I'm likely to talk about, although there might be slight differences in, in, in um, certain factors. But um, so that's the sort of disclaimer there. So community palliative care in general provide palliative care nurses, and that is, I think, the number one core business uh, or service provision that we provide, um, as well as social workers, um, occupational therapists. Um, we have music therapists and massage therapists, um, client support volunteers, and also palliative care physicians. Clients who are admitted under our service get access to support 24-7, um, for troubleshooting um, any client or carer concerns. They get help with pain and other symptom relief. They can get equipment to aid care at home. Um, they get social work input for sensitive or complex issues, um, particularly around um, also emotional support or if there are um, increased services required. Um, we have yeah, music therapists and massage therapists um, to help improve people's um, quality of life and help people with, um, uh, yeah, in, I guess to improve the quality of life um, at, at that time, um, and also respite and support. Another useful um, intervention that that will that we can provide is if someone is deteriorating at home, as well as supporting them to remain where they are. If someone is deteriorating at home and things become too difficult, or if that person has chosen that um, their end of life um, wish would be actually to die in an inpatient palliative care setting, we can also usually facilitate a direct transfer from home um, into, uh, into a palliative care unit. So um, if someone's deteriorating at home, um, one of our nurses will attend, um, provide symptom 
medications and then we can liaise directly with the palliative care unit to get someone transferred directly in, which means that people do not have to go via emergency ambulance into an emergency department, which is um, really a, a it's an, not a pleasant experience, especially at the end of life. So moving on now, um, we might talk a bit about our case study. Um, this is a fictional case study, um, which is just designed to sort of represent how um, the course of uh, um, an admission with a community palliative care service may go. Um, and so if there's any resemblances to any sort of um, uh, cases that you're aware of, it's coincidental only. So um, Mark um, was referred in at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday. It could have been uh, yesterday afternoon by an aged care case manager, and it was marked urgent. There was no medical information and the intake phone call um, to the home. So referral was received, and then our intake team called the home. And the story was that Mark was having trouble getting out of bed. He was only eating and drinking small amounts. He had pain, shortness of breath, cough, uh, functional decline. He had had recent multiple admissions to hospital and his wish was that he wanted to remain at home for end-of-life care. So at that time, um, medical information request was sent to Mark's GP clinic and also the local hospital. So in a bit more detail, Mark is a 76-year-old man who has got a history of end-stage COPD. Um, he has past medical history, which includes chronic back pain, asthma, hyperlipidemia, a previous total knee replacement, some chronic renal failure, uh, and he's had three admissions to hospital in the last six months um, and with a significant functional decline over the past three months. And he's now essentially chair-bound with mild shortness of breath at rest. Um, socially, he has a wife, Sarah, two adult grandchildren and four grandchildren. So there are a number of um, red flags or poor prognostic signs already for Mark um, as well. well. Firstly, his end-stage COPD, um, but recurrent hospital presentations is a poor prognostic sign, um, especially also functional deterioration, um, which almost regardless of uh, primary diagnosis is a poor prognostic sign. Um, and breathlessness at rest is also a very poor prognostic sign. So um, regardless of the level of intervention offered to Mark, he's got a difficult road ahead. So he's seen by our Banksia nurse um, the following morning. And at that time, the nursing assessment is that he was very short of breath. He had a moist cough. He had some back pain. Minimal oral intake. So his oral intake has dropped off significantly. He's got a dry mouth. So taking his tablets is becoming harder for him. Uh, at this point, there's no other um, gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, functional decline is quite significant. Um, he has increased care needs and his wife is quite distressed by his deterioration. Unfortunately, his um, general practitioner only works from Monday to Wednesday. Um, and he was last seen face-to-face -face about four months ago. At the time, he has um, medications uh, which he usually takes, which include Tarjan, um, which is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, sustained-release oxycodone with naloxone, um, 10 uh, milligrams of oxycodone, 5 milligrams of naloxone, taken twice daily um, for his back pain, and PRN, uh, oxycodone immediate release, uh, resuvastatin, uh, some Panadol osteo, uh, a couple of puffers, and a bit of prednisolone. Oh, and he also has got an allergy to morphine, uh, which has been included because um, a morphine allergy is usually... Severe nausea and vomiting is a common side effect of morphine and not ne necessarily representative of... Um, uh, IgE-mediated allergy. So what are the considerations in how we might support Mark to die at home? 
So one of the things is first engaging back with his um, GP clinic and ideally his GP, but if his GP is not a, is away, then how we're going to manage um, if he were to deteriorate and die, provision of a death certificate for him and his family, um, any equipment needs, um, access to end of life and comfort care medications to manage his symptoms. Um, we need to organize regular nursing visits. Um, his stressed wife is going and, and he will benefit from access to after our support um, and also practical and emotional support for um, the family. Looking forward, also um, some bereavement support for the family post Mark's death. So the assessment of the nurse was that Mark was quite clearly deteriorating and likely approaching the terminal phase and he had a wish to die at home. So the nurse contact the general, general practitioner clinic and there were some changes made as follows. So because of the difficulties with him swallowing medications, he was um, rotated, um, uh, which is a term that we use in palliative medicine. We change one opioid to another. So he was rotated from Targen um, to um, a fentanyl patch um, um, for provision of pain relief um, without requiring or relying upon his swallow. Um, he, his endone or oxycodone immediate release was changed to oxynorm liquid. And there were also um, appropriate end of life injectable medications organized. Um, at that point, um, even though he was still able to swallow, um, these were organized at this point in time um, because it was 10 a.m. on a Thursday. And um, it's easier at that time than when things are changing, but we'll see it later on. So those medications, including hydromorphone um, for injection, metoclopramide um, for injection, uh, buscopan for injection, and also, uh, which is for secretion management, um, and some clonazepam oral uh, drops, which are now PBS listed for um, management of agitation in palliative care. There's a little note there about Safer Care Victoria and palliative care clinical guidance. Um, there is a um, there is a reference list at the end of this presentation, but if you drop off before the end, um, I my my number one, two, and three recommendation is. Safer Care Victoria, Safer Care Victoria, Safer Care Victoria, plus palliative care. There are excellent resources around um, safe end of life care prescribing, um, management of dying patients, um, and really just excellent um, uh, or opioid rotation and just, just wonderful, uh, reliable uh, palliative care resources. So um, I use on a daily basis, resources from Safe Care Victoria, including the opioid rotation um, and anticipated prescribing um, charts. So, sorry to jump around a bit there, but check it out. Um, so there's at this time, so on the Thursday, education provided to the carers regarding the medication changes, including action plans and symptom management plans. Um, with verbal and written information provided. So we provide people with a pack of, of information, including the phone number to call um, and write down what to do in certain situations. Practical information given, including slide sheets, pressure area care, mouth care, um, care needs um, and bereavement risk and funeral plans, depending on the situations and, and how the conversation goes may have been discussed. Um, at the time, there's also an urgent equipment request by the social worker. And sometimes the social worker is involved with that. Sometimes our occupational therapist is involved or it may just be a senior nurse that's involved. And then a referral made to Care Gateway. And Care Gateway is a, a separate service who can come sometimes come in for limited periods of time and provide additional help with, with personal care um, and hands-on support for families. So the comprehensive review of the nurse um, uh, that has then handed over appropriately to the rest of the Banksia palliative care team that um, faxed an update to the GP clinic as well uh, after liaising directly over the phone with the GP clinic. Um, and at that time 
has they've planned regular nursing visits for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, social work for ongoing support. So at this time, it was, I think we mentioned this person was approaching the terminal phase. So we in palliative care, we have um, sort of different definitions about what phase someone is in their illness. And probably up until this point, Max, probably what we'd call deteriorating phase. That is someone who's um, for whom things are changing over um, probably weeks, we think, um, but he's he's not he's not getting better, he's clearly getting worse. And for someone like this, we we usually organize relatively frequent visits, although not necessarily every day. But on Sunday, and usually is Sunday or a weekend uh, after hours, there is a page that he's um, deteriorating and he's having difficulty swallowing. He's got worsening chest secretions and restlessness. Um, and at that time, um, he is um, requiring a bit of hydromorphone um, subcutaneously um, for pain or advice is given that he may be given that for pain or shortness of breath. Um, a buscopan for secretions and um, clonazepam as required for anxiety or distress. So he's then assessed on the Monday and found that he's clearly in what we would call the terminal phase. And so from a palliative care perspective that we would refer to the terminal phase when someone has got a prognosis of days uh, or when for someone for whom that death is um, um, yeah, inevitable and unlikely to occur very soon. Um, and so once that is recognised, um, we would usually uh, change our visiting to daily. At this time, Mark was having ongoing issues with shortness of breath, secretions and restlessness. Um, and a decision was made together with his um, general practitioner to start a syringe driver. Um, so for, I'm sure most people are aware, but for those who aren't, a syringe driver is a continuous subcutaneous infusion, which is um, provided via a little safety intima butterfly needle, which just sits under the skin. Um, we don't need to find a vein or anything like that. Um, and it provides a continuous uh, infusion of medications over a 24 hour period. And the medications chosen um, for Mark were uh, hydromorphone, three milligrams, um, buscopan, and midazolam, 10 milligrams over 24 hours. Um, so those are pretty typical medications to use. Um, hydromorphone, um, we often, just as a note about why we chose hydromorphone for Mark, you, I think we mentioned previously his creatinine of 160. If someone's got um, a renal impairment, usually we use a cutoff. Each, we didn't list his EGFR, but I suspect it's around about 30 based on his um, creatinine. Um, if someone's got an EGFR less than 30 or creatinine clearance less than 30, we tend to avoid morphine and, and use a different agent such as hydromorphone or fentanyl. Um, and often we'll go for hydromorphone um, in the first instance, although there is some practice variability. Um, but if some, uh, because of, uh, especially in the, the terminal phase or if someone is, um, is, is, yeah, is in the community setting, um, fentanyl has quite a short half-life. So hydromorphone can, um, has a half-life more similar to morphine. So if you, if someone's uncomfortable and they're needing a breakthrough dose, then it's likely to hang around for a little bit longer, which is our desired effect. Um, as well as um, the medications that we've provided, we've also at this time are engaging. We have ENs that work alongside or within our team um, and they can come and assist with some personal care assistance as well for uh, limited um, time. But generally when someone's in the terminal phase or if someone's in the final uh, days or, or short weeks, then we have a uh, some of a, some capacity to support people in this way. And then Mark died comfortably on the Friday night at 11 p.m. Our Banksia nurse visited to provide the verification of death, which is a usual practice, um, and notification of death um, was faxed to the GP. And then there, um, we also provided bereavement support for the family. So just some take-home messages 
key aspects to the case with Mark is the availability of the general practitioner. I think I sort of alluded to the fact that he, the general practitioner um, of Mark only worked Monday to Wednesday. In this case, this fictional case, we were able to engage one of the other practitioners at, at, the, at the practice who to help out. That is often um, a really helpful thing if we're able to do that, um, if, if there's cross cover that's able to be provided by other general practitioners at the same practice, um, that can be really helpful for us. Um, having that prompt access to injectable medication. So um, although it may, um, if, if, if one hasn't had much exposure to palliative care patients or people who have palliative goals of care, um, the provision or organisation of injectable medications at that point, so when someone can still swallow, can be a bit surprising. But actually, um, this case, I think, probably highlights that the importance is that if, if that's someone's wish to remain at home, organisation of those medications prior to that deterioration happening is quite key so that when um, everything falls apart out of hours and um, and someone's distressed, the, then an ambulance doesn't need to be called in order for analgesia to be given or um, something for restlessness. So... Um, that's a sort of key aspect of getting things to work well. It's provision of equipment. So particularly with Banksia, we will actually fund equipment up to about six weeks. Um, and usually things that people might require would include a hospital bed, um, maybe a commode um, uh, and, um, and or a gate aid, depending on the situation. Um, increased carer supports is a key a key thing to keeping people at home. Usually the one of the determining factors about whether someone who wants to die at home is able to stay at home is is care 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 capacity really. Um, it's it's not usually the medications that need to be given. It's usually um, can someone actually take care of them because we can provide the same syringe drivers, the same doses, the same types of same drugs really in almost all cases. It's really more about um, how their care network is able to cope. Um, so building that um, broader support network for um, a patient and their family um, or their carers um, is key. Um, regular palliative care nursing support is essential. There, there's the um, there's a whole different set of normals that happen when people are dying and they're normal for people who deal with people dying every day, but they're very different to everyday life. And so having um, someone come in who is experienced and to say, that's not something to worry about. That's something I see every day and they're comfortable. That's just a normal part of it. For instance, something like um, the death rattle or noisy secretions around end of life and having that reassurance can be extremely helpful for um, families um, as well as saying, oh, actually, no, that they look uncomfortable and they need extra medications or they need a change in medications, whatever that might be. Um, social work support, again, a very key aspect of what we do. And then verification of death and the provision of a death certificate is another um, very important part of the um, appropriate and good care of someone a person, um, including after they die. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Just being mindful of time, I'll try and keep things moving. Um, so Mark's case is one of late referral, um, and ideally we would have liked to have heard about him sooner um, and, and had him referred to earlier to our service. And many patients are with us for many months and some for up to two plus years. Um, and if people are stable, we may actually discharge patients and then readmit them if they're deteriorating again. And so um, if there are patients, people for whom you think that um, a referral might be appropriate, I would encourage you to make that referral. And then if they are, uh, that is if they, they, they would like to be referred and that you have the consent. Um, if we think that they have need, we will admit them. And if they're stable, we can discharge them off later. But um, we don't, um, we'd like to avoid uh, admitting patients in the final hours, days, week of their lives. You know, it really, a lot of the work that we're able to do to make things go well happens when we have that time to 
build rapport, to understand people's end of life care wishes, um, to assist them with advanced care planning, and also to provide that symptom management along the way. So for Mark, he's had a chronic illness and chronic breathlessness, which potentially could have been better managed in the months leading up to his death as well. So look, this is last, these next few slides are sort of a brief, sort of quick run through summary of things that um, Banksy or pall that palliative care services can provide. And, and, and they kind of, it's sort of telling you what I told you before. So apologies for um, any doubling up, but common interventions, medications and supports that we do. So regular visits from RNs for, to assess the symptoms and trajectory of patients, um, emergency provision of equipment, um, in the context of functional deterioration or end of life care settings, um, support from social work, grief counselors, and also other allied health team members. From a medication perspective, so how RNs and senior nurses will provide specialist advice around symptom management medications, um, but the GP remains the treating doctor. Um, we will often ask for anticipatory medications um, and if the goals of care are for comfort measures in the event of a deterioration, then having end-of-life care medications at home prevents unnecessary hospitalisation and suffering. Um, just coming back to that point around our senior nurses providing specialist advice, you know, we deal with medications which, which um, you know, are some of some gems. So my wife's a GP, and and she. Um, she sees very few patients with palliative care needs. And so uh, I see very few patients with GP needs as well. But the, the nurses that work at Banksy Palliative Care are dealing with these medications every day, especially the senior ones. So whenever we're thinking about an opioid rotation or a high-risk drug like hydromorphone, um, putting someone on a fentanyl patch, fentanyl patch, there's always the involvement of a senior nurse um, uh, who... To, to, to double check recommendations um, or to um, ensure that whatever that plan is, is safe. So if we're providing medication suggestions, it's it's always with discussion with someone who's, who's making those higher level decisions, um, not on a daily, but on a multiple times per day type basis. Um, because I mean, realistically, the medications that we use are very uh, are high risk, um, you know, opioids, benzodiazepines, um, you know, even antipsychotics like haloperidol, which we use for nausea, these are um, have potentially have adverse side effects, um, and you need to be familiar with the correct dosages um, and administration. So it can be, um, I suppose, a little bit. Um, it's not in every setting where you would you'd have nurses recommending to doctors what to prescribe, and ultimately it is the doctor who is prescribing the medication. So if you're not 100% sure, you feel free to give us a call and have a chat about it. Um, you can call the Banksy Palliative Care number, um, speak to the nurse um, who's made the recommendation or the desk nurse is generally a very senior nurse. Um, and usually there's a palliative care physician around as well. So if there's something that doesn't like to ask why we're we doing that or should we do something different, just give us a buzz. Um, but usually it, it's coming from someone quite senior. Um, and then palliative care physicians available for special support and advice around complex cases. So um, I mentioned briefly our um, uh, numbers. We've, I think we've got around 450 active clients at the moment. Um, we do have a palliative care physician in every day, Monday to Friday now, and some days we've got two. Um, but that they probably that's sort of one doctor for 450 patients. So um, they, we don't have capacity to, to sort of see everyone who's on our service. Um, and, and that's why it still sort of remains the general practitioner as the primary care physician. I might just jump through quickly because we've got more things. Okay. Um, I'm just mindful of time. Talking now about medical um, MCCD or uh, medical certification of cause of death. So the legal purpose of this is for the validity of a will um, or a life insurance payment. There's also a statistical and public health purpose. These are coded by um, the ABS for evaluation and development of uh, measures to improve the health of Australians. For family members, it's really important um, to know what caused the death and to be aware of conditions that may occur in other family members. This is something that uh, I deal with in my, not so much in my work at Banksia, but in my work at, at um, 
the hospital that I work for, um, sometimes junior doctors may not be aware that when they write a certain diagnosis as the cause of death for someone that that, that certificate will be sent to the family. And so I'm, I always tell my junior staff to be mindful that, you know, make sure what we're writing as the cause of death is what the um, would be acceptable also to the family. Um, obviously you have to write down what's medically correct, um, but I've had situations where um, certain diagnoses have been put down, um, put down and, and then they've been requests to change it after the fact. So um, always just something to keep in mind. And there is a safeguard purpose to the MCCD as well, which is to prevent the disposal of bodies without professional scrutiny in relation to suspicious deaths. Um, we will continue to support and visit clients and their support network every day until a patient dies. Um, and a Banksia palliative care nurse will attend the home and complete a verification of death. Um, we'll provide the family with a written documentation of the same um, and we comply by the Victorian Department of Health's verification of death guidelines. Um, uh, the client's care will then be transferred to the deceased clients and care as preferred funeral service. Um, and the client's nominated uh, GP or primary health care provider will be informed of the death and asked to complete the client's medical certification of cause of death online. So in terms of eligibility, it would be to complete the MCCD. It can be a doctor who is responsible for a person's medical care immediately before death or who examines the body of a deceased person after death. And they must, within 48 hours after the death, notify the registrar of um, the death and of the cause of the death in a form and manner approved by the registrar and specifying any pre prescribed particulars. And these days, it's uh, I think it's just, it's a very simple online thing. Um, I would suggest if you're not yet registered with births, deaths and marriages to um, do death certificates, um, that process can sometimes take up to 24 hours to do. So if you haven't done that yet, I'd do that so that um, there's no delays um, if, 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 if you are required to, to do someone's certificate. In terms of just terms, the cause of death. So the cause of death is the disease or injury which initiated the train of morbid events leading um, directly to death or the circumstances of the accident or violence which produced the fatal injury. Um, and this, again, I guess sometimes the way that I talk with my junior staff when I'm on the inpatient palliative care unit would be um, if um, this, for instance, that someone who has been admitted who has got metastatic lung cancer with widespread metastases um, comes in and they've got biliary obstruction and, and they become uh, jaundiced and they ultimately die. Uh, the primary cause of death is not liver failure. The primary cause of death is metastatic lung cancer. Um, so if, even if they're dying sort of from liver failure, the, the, the reason for them lying in the bed at that point in time is, is the primary disease. And so that can be sometimes helpful. Um, if someone's at home and they're just progressively deteriorating and they've got um, which all people who have been admitted to palliative care, to, to community palliative care will have is a life limiting disease if they've got particularly if they've got metastatic cancer and they're functionally deteriorating it almost always is um for me that the, the the primary cause is is the their their, their cancer um if, if they're deteriorating so even if they've got a if they've got a functional deterioration uh or they've got increased susceptibility to infections it's it's, it's usually um going to be um I can't say in every single case, but in, in the vast majority of cases, it is related to their primary illness. Um, and in most cases, our nurses will request that the general practitioner completes the MCCD as the primary cheating practitioner. Um, in some cases, we may ask hospital doctors um, to complete. For instance, if they've just been discharged home and they haven't been seen by their GP or the GP hasn't been involved at all. In some cases, our Banksia PCPs may complete it as well. Um, but again, we, we don't often have capacity really to actually meet all of the clients that we're involved with. Um, and also we usually don't have the same sort of longitudinal relationship with patients and their families that um, that ideally um, you know, GP would. Um... And if no one 
the worst case scenario, no one's able to complete an MCCD then. Unfortunately, those cases are actually passed to the office of the coroner, which can be quite a distressing event for families, um, especially if they were not, if it, I mean, obviously it would be distressing in, in if there were suspicious circumstances or traumatic circumstances leading to a death. But even if something is, um, if something's very clearly related to their metastatic disease or their their primary diagnosis and they die, having for that case to go to the coroner can be quite a um, difficult thing to deal with. Um, so I'll just touch on grief and bereavement. We provide some supports for people um, after death um, up to, uh, for uh, I think it's 12 to 18 months. Um, and that, uh, uh, and we also will refer people on to um, other services such as Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement. Um, we generally, we we also, it would usually be, our, I think, our social workers who are currently providing our bereavement follow-up. Um, and we also have remembrance services and um, walking groups. How to refer to community palliative care. So if you want to refer to us at Banksia, you can, firstly, the person has to live within our catchment area and they have to have given consent. Um, and then you can refer via our website or give us a call. Or if you don't know where or which community palliative care service someone um, can be referred to, it's determined by really that, where they live. And if, and to find that, I would suggest that you go to this website, palcarevic.com asn.au or just google palliative care victoria and then and there's a big sort of button that says find a service near you um, click that and then you can search by postcode um, or, or suburb and there will only be one um, community palliative care service at least one uh, publicly funded um, community palliative care service that that person can access another aspect of what we do is we help link people in um, who are appropriate and wish to be involved in clinical research trials. Um, we uh, do this um, largely via the COMET team, um, which is a, a, a team um, based mainly out of um, Royal Melbourne Hospital and Peter Mac, um, who's, who, whose um, aim it is to, to sort of increase engagement in community participants in um, clinical trials. And so there's a number of um, trials listed there um, should you be interested and the pathway to accessing those trials would be um, probably uh, so if they're admitted to our service then we have got a number of clinicians who will go and talk to people about um, involvement with this and then refer people through um, and I think I'm almost I think I'm done <laughs> um, and so I would just also like to acknowledge um, everyone who's contributed, um, Dr. Chin Lin for many of these slides um, and from Banksia, uh, Michelle Wood, uh, Tamalyn Carr, Wendy Palmer, um, a number of people also from Eastern Palliative Care um, and from Eastern Metropolitan Primary Health Network and Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network as well. Um, and there's some references there. So hopefully six minutes for questions. Um, I might hand over back to you, Nicole. Thank you so much. I will just quickly share my screen. Uh, bear with me one moment. Uh, so now we're just gonna discuss Health Pathways. Health Pathways Melbourne is a collaborative online resource developed by Eastern Melbourne and Northwestern Melbourne primary healthcare networks in partnership with healthcare professionals and organisations in the Melbourne region. Health Pathways Melbourne provides clinicians with a single website to access a comprehensive collection of locally relevant clinical information and guidelines designed to support general practitioners and other healthcare providers in delivering consistent and evidence-based care to their patients. This presentation will demonstrate how to access and navigate Health Pathways Melbourne to find the relevant pathways. Health Pathways Melbourne is a collaborative online resource developed by Eastern Navigating Health Pathways. Visit the Health Pathways Melbourne website and log in. 
search for the relevant pathway by using the search bar at the top of the page or by navigating through the table of contents on the left hand side. Find the page that's relevant. A clinical editor's note is a brief temporary note that's added by a senior clinician about a development in the wider health system or community that may affect how a clinician assesses or manages their patient. It allows the user to quickly find significant or new information that directly may affect local user practice as can be seen here with the GP respiratory clinics, priority primary care centres and the thunderstorm asthma alert. The assessment section is a concise list of steps users may consider taking to diagnose and evaluate the severity of a patient at the point of care. Drop boxes throughout the pathway provide supplementary information and links to suggested screening tools that may be useful. The management section is a succinct list of steps users may consider taking and includes additional information needed to execute these steps and links to referral options. This section includes locally relevant requests and referrals that a clinician might request from a third party for their patient and provides the information on the clinical criteria for each option. Now, PHN catchments. To access Health Pathways Melbourne, go to the website address melbourne.healthpathways.org.au. Uh, and if you don't have access yet, you can click on register, which brings up an online form. We can also organise automatic login for you so you can access Health Pathways with the username and password. And just email the team on info at healthpathwaysmelbourne.org.au. And that's all from us. I will now pass it back to Chen. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, this is a bit of Q&A time. I know we have one minute left, but um, uh, essentially, if you have any questions and haven't typed in the uh, uh, in the Q&A, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, is there some way I can enable everyone to speak or? <laughs> no, unfortunately, um, but people can type in the chat. Okay, great, great. So uh, definitely uh, type in the chat if you have anything. And, um, but yes, uh, uh, let us know. So I'll uh, quickly go through, because the. Uh, there were having some questions in the Q and A that I've typed answer to, but I will also answer them verbally now. So, uh, first question was about um, you know the, the GPs who work nine to five several days only uh, has not seen a patient for more than four months, um, uh, even involved in nursing home care, um, and, and that's that just seems it's a common scenario seems. Um, not great and um, and which yeah look unfortunately this does happen um, perhaps more even more in the young oncology space where you know patients are absorbed by the hospital system haven't had time to see the GP until they run out of treatments from hospital so um, but yes uh, we also know patients who with chronic disease and aged care um, uh, that does depend on their health seeking behavior and people who essentially ever only ever attend ED uh, and no other doctors <laughs> and don't engage with preventive care so it can be an issue. Uh, the second question was why choose uh, buscopin over glyco or atropine? So uh, buscopin is PBS subsidized it's much more available from community pharmacies so when people are at home we definitely source buscopin more than anything 
And uh, in fact, Baskerville has uh, uh, quite a lot of evidence and arguably uh, more, although I'm slightly biased because I'm a GP myself, <laughs> but uh, arguably more evidence for uh, the you know, end of life care secretion management in this space is internationally. And um, we do care about um, renal function um, and that was the other question in this space, mainly because of morphine, uh, because it has neuroexcitatory metabolites. Uh, often we, we're not too worried, or in fact, drowsiness and fatigue may or may not be avoidable anyway, because there's so many other factors, but you know, um, agitation, myoclonic jerks, and occasionally, well, rarely, but bad if it happens, hyperalgesia and seizures uh, definitely can occur uh, with accumulation of neuroexcitatory metabolites. So, um, but if we can only get morphine and the person's in pain and dying, we obviously will still use it and they may or may not have time to worry about accumulation. Um, often care or changes in treatment may be via phone consultations. Can you bill Medicare? Yes, uh, the requirement for phone and telehealth is as usual. Um, then you, you need to have seen them. Well, actually someone from the clinic needs to have seen them in the last 12 months. And that can be your practice nurse. It doesn't have to be. Um, uh, the, one of the doctors, but certainly very helpful if it's one of the doctors. And um, in terms of uh, just, you need to speak to the patient or their medical treatment decision maker if the patient's not able to speak to you, of course. And uh, we do send you, um, and a, a few services do send you uh, care plan letters uh, in that uh, because we know uh, we can prepare uh, the item 729 or 731 and we fill it and send it back, you can build it. Um, in terms of whether it's possible in end-of-life care, um, yeah, look, we, we try to engage before we need to provide terminal phase care, and that is very important uh, to prepare rather than to catch up. <laughs> and that's that's uh, the main main point as well, is that, um, you know, if you have someone that hasn't, for some reason, hasn't been uh, referred to palliative care that you think is likely to, um, uh, to have that need, with, uh, and uh, the, especially if your preference is at home, please definitely uh, highlight it and uh, link them in. So um, that's all the questions in the Q&A. Um, I've typed in a few notes in the chat as well, just to supplement um, Scott's great talk. And um, yeah, and um, hopefully um, everyone has uh, had a great time tonight will be uh nicole do you want to talk through the post event stuff sorry yeah, absolutely uh, thank you so much um thank you all so much for being a part of tonight's session it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here tonight um i hope you have taken away some valuable insights and i'd also like to extend a very special thank you to our exceptional presenters for their fabulous work by participating in tonight's racgp accredited activity you will receive one hour in education activities uh, and i will lodge those hours through the racgp on your behalf so that we can further improve these education workshops, please take a moment to fill in the event survey. You can do so now by scanning the QR code on your screen and it's the one that to your far left. At the end of this session, the survey link will also appear on your screen. Your responses are greatly appreciated and highly valued. This is a five part series. And if you haven't done so already, please register yourself for the next session, uh, which will be covering delirium and the use of sedatives in, the, in community palliative care. It is being held on Zoom. Uh, on Thursday, the 12th of October from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And this is another accredited RACGP accredited session. Uh, you can scan the third QR code to register yourself for this virtual education activity. Please also take a moment to check out other upcoming infant education events, and you can do so by scanning the middle QR code on your screen, and it will take you directly to our events page on the infant website, where you'll be able to find out more information about what other education workshops we have coming up. There will be a follow-up email that everyone will receive, which will include a copy of the presentations you have seen tonight, in addition to other relevant resources. You will also receive your certificates uh, within the next four weeks of this session from MFIM. Thank you all so much for your time and attention this evening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much.